and just so you visitors know, I am lovingly referred to as the pastor's son. <laughs> In some circles, the PK. So my dad, he's in Indianapolis speaking, and uh, so if you want to get the normal service, if there's such a thing, you might have to come back. <laughs> and I hope I don't spoil you, so when you see him, you feel like, gosh, when are they going to let that guy take over? <laughs> no, not my intentions, trust me, but I am here. Well, we welcome you, and I will say this to those watching regularly and everybody else here, and to the visitors, welcome, but I do want to say something that was impressed upon me this morning, and that's that on behalf of my family, and I, and I tell you this, and coming from me, hopefully it, it seems, you, you know, sincere in the sense I'm, I'm representing not only myself, but basically my parents and, and my sister and my, my family, that we do appreciate you as a body and as a family. And I know my dad says that, and, but it's not said enough, really, in the sense I, I was reading through the letters from Paul, and can hear, you guys hear me okay, Duncans? Hi. Um, you know, Paul, when he wrote letters to the church, he constantly said, hey, greetings. Blessed are you. Thank you. And at the end, he'd always say, we're just, we love you. We're praying for you all the time. We appreciate you. We're hearing of your good works. We're uh, he was appreciative, and I, I tell you, um, we appreciate you as a, as a body. I know it's never, I don't want to say never, I don't like absolutes. It doesn't seem like that there's enough fellowship dinners and enough services and enough things where we can all really truly get to know each other on a, on a super personal level and, and hang out and that sort of thing. But I don't know if in this day and age, that's a real hard thing to do. I'm just telling you. So it's not, we do do those things, and it does help. But we appreciate you. I know my parents appreciate you. I, I watched, I know what my dad, quote, left and sacrificed in order to do what he does. As a matter of fact, and I had no intentions of going here, but I'm going here. I, uh, I wouldn't go to church when I was a younger person. I say younger, oh, from my teens into 20s, this uh, period in there, because I grew up in the church, and I was one of those people that thought that the organized church was probably one of the worst things that could happen to the gospel. I was a Christian, believed in Jesus, but thought we were all a bunch of goofballs playing church and, and hypocrite. You know, you know how you get, or people are, especially sometimes idealistic teenagers who have to learn, maybe they grew up in church, so that they had, uh, I had a drug problem when I was younger. I was drugged to church on Sunday. I was drugged to church on Wednesday night. I was drugged to every new church, the Pentecostal church that opened up trying to find one that felt right. And if you are taught these things, it says teach your children in the way they should go and when, when they grow up, they'll uh, come back. Well, that, you know, they gotta come back from something. So if you got children that aren't where you think they should be, have faith. The scripture says, the scripture that says the children of the righteous shall be delivered, that's as true as John 3, 16 and any other verse that you stand on. And for parents, it's difficult to be in pure faith for your children because you have a, a, just a, this extra sense of worry that's really hard to go around. I mean, and you, it's, it really is. And I've seen it with a lot of parents or in, in the ministry especially or in the church where there's kids that aren't where you'd like them to be but you just need to rest and let God do his thing and that opens doors for God to do his thing and he'll take care of them and just because they don't attend your church or wear it dressed the way you want them to dress in their church doesn't mean that they're not okay sometimes but anyway, I encourage you, if I'm standing up here on a Sunday morning, I'm telling you, your kid is not too far away. <laughs> Proof. <laughs> For real. Have faith. And I think it's time genera generationally that we come together, including the millennials, which is my kid's age. The <laughs> I'm not going to get do what I wanted to do, but it's not about me. 
But uh, somebody needs this. We all need this. And we are a faith church and we teach faith. But you know what? Faith, you don't just get it once and you got it. You got to feed that. You got to feed that faith. You got to grow and build in that faith. And when it comes to children and family members, it can be difficult. And that's why we pray for one another. If I pray for you and we ask each other to pray for one another, because I may not have the biases or the hangups emotionally that you have in your situation. So I can pray for you. And if we're all praying for one another, which I believe is the, the, we tend to think of prayer as God, I, I, I. But if we're saying God the way Jesus did, he prayed for others. And that's the model prayer. Even in the Lord's prayer, he said, us, give us. He didn't say, give me. So when you're praying, if, if you're led by the Spirit, I think you'll, you'll tend to find yourself in intercessory prayer more than uh, individual prayer. God knows your problems. And you know what? We, got, we have problems. It's okay. It's okay to be a church, a faith church, and have some issues. It's going to happen. It doesn't say no weapon form, will be formed against you. It just says it won't prosper. So we've got to stand tall. We wouldn't need an armor if there wasn't a battle. And sometimes it don't seem fair. God, I have this revelation knowledge of you. I'm, I'm spirit filled. And the Joneses over here don't know squat and their families together and their yard looks like a golf course and they're smiling all the time and he makes six figures and they don't seem to have, well, that's, I'm sorry, but you can't, I'm not sorry, but you can't go by that. You know, we are set apart and we're part of our, what we're aware of, which is victorious. But what we're aware of puts us in a different place. And you're not going to see the world and things exactly like the world sees things. And sometimes the enemy will come at you and make you think, well, this isn't fair. And make you want to give up. But you can't take a week off of being a Christian. It don't work that way. That's why we come to church. To be fed, to encourage one another. So we get out there. And we keep on keeping on, staying in the Word, staying in prayer, building ourselves up, getting over ourselves. I mean, I am one, I have to get over myself hugely to be up here. I mean, big time, because it's not, and don't get this wrong, it's not because I, I because I care about you and God, I don't want to get in between that in, in a bad way, right? I don't want it to be about me, his will, and, but anyway, let me get to what I was going to do. Actually, I was going to start out, we were talking about uh, Hebrew culture, I was just, we're going to take a little side note and get into a, a little Hebrew lesson. If you know my mom, I always tease her saying, telling her, I tell her that she wants to be a Jew when she grows up. She's very interested in the things of the Hebraic world, and it's very interesting. And after going to Israel, you know, I'm, I'm into that stuff too. I'm a mixture of my mom and my dad, and, and uh, duh. <laughs> but I enjoy the Hebrew, not to the extreme that she does, not that it isn't a wrong extreme, but she really loves it. And she teaches Hebrew, she teaches on Hebrew. And so there's something that you may have seen if you've been with my mom. It's just a little side note. I was reminded of it reading a book the other day, and I thought, you know what, I'll share this Sunday because it's kind of cool. And in John 1, I'll go there. Okay, I'm going to say this, and I, I don't have a necessarily authority, but I'm not announcing anything. I'm just going to get kind of a see what kind of response. I'm flipping through my Bible to get to John 1. We have it on the sky. I've thought about just for fun once every so many months having a wow unplugged. A service where no cell phones allowed. We turn all this stuff off. This, isn't, this, we, this stuff reaches out to the world, so I'm not talking about that it's wrong or we're doing away with it, give our video and audio people a chance to come to church. Have our Bibles and some, and some words to the songs in a, in a piece of paper and have some old school unplugged church. I think some of you would probably enjoy that. Not all the time, but that way just let's turn everything off and even 
and, and just, and it's not a better way, but it would just be kind of cool once in a while to not, and we're not going to ever not stream or anything like that online church. Uh, we appreciate that, but just as a local body, it's kind of another chance to get to know one another and feel a little bit more intimate in church. Just a thought. I'm not announcing anything, but would anybody participate? Okay, so would I. It was my idea. Well, anyway, John 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it continues to say, but we'll just go ahead and stop there. It says, In the beginning. You know, John was a, a knew the Old Testament. I mean, he knew the Old Testament. And for him to reference in the beginning, he was referencing in the beginning. That's Bereshit, Barah, I'm not sure. But in the beginning in Hebrew, I mean, that's the way the Bible starts in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning. So he, he's saying something here. He says, in the beginning was the Word, Jesus. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And it goes on to say that all things are created through Him and for Him. And uh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. A tremendous revelation, actually, for the Hebrew people to say the Word. But they knew even more than what, what we know that they knew. Because if you go to Genesis 1-1, and we'll get the first slide that Gwen had sent you, Angie, if you have it. And I'll try my, hopefully my coffee's starting to dilute in my system. It's coffee, I promise, it's not nerves. Okay, here's, here is the uh, Hebrew. Hebrew reads from right to left. And Amos, I'm going to go ahead and use you, if you don't mind, to say this stuff. I just want this to be clear to you. But this is, from here over to here is... In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, which is, um, underneath it, it's Vera. I'll let him say it. This, this right here, Vera Sheet, I'll let him do it. Go up to the Hebrew real quick. Oh, up here? Vera Sheet, Vara, Elohim, which is God, et, no translation, <clears throat> Hashemim, heavens, Vaetz, and Haaretz, the earth. Okay, did you get that? Was he on? Give her a mic. Okay. Okay, it's on. Bereshit, which is beginning. Bara, which is created. Elohim, which is God. Et, no translation for that word. <clears throat> Hashemim, heavens. Va'et, and Ha'aretz, the land. Okay, thank you. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's what this says. It says, Bereshit, Bara, Elohim, et, Hashemim, et, Ha'aretz, whatever. Um, <laughs> Anyway, as he was saying this, he said et, which is this right here, and he said there's no translation for that. That's there, but it doesn't, they didn't make a word for it. It says in the beginning God, or in the beginning God's, Elohim is actually plural, referring to the triunal, so don't get weird, but in the beginning God's created heaven and earth. But there's this et in there, which is an aleph and a tav. So why didn't they translate it? Well, it wasn't really, and it's found other places in the Old Testament. But, so if you go to the next slide, et, aleph, tav, this is the aleph, which is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, aleph bet, which means strength. And tav is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph Bet, which is Tav, which can mean covenant and various other things. So there's this word, Aleph Tav, in Hebrew, 
that sits there in Genesis 1-1 that continues as they kept repeating, you know, rewriting and copying this book. It was always there and it had to stay there because it was the Word of God. And they would count, I mean, they, it had to be, part of the purpose of the Hebrew people was to uh, copy and, and uh, preserve and keep safe the Word of God over the years. You know, they didn't have internet then. They didn't have thumb drives or publishing companies. They had scribes that went through and hand wrote this stuff. So anyway, now let's go to, now that's Hebrew for the first and last letter of the, if you were to translate that, you know what that would be in Greek? That would be the first and last letter of the Greek alphabet, alpha and omega. So in Revelation 1.3 and in 1.8, Jesus says, remember he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. See, if you actually kind of get a little bit of a hold on this, it's kind of one of those goosebumpy things. But in, let's see, chapter 1, verse 3, or uh, chapter 1, verse 11, Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And then over again in chapter but he says it again. So, what, but that's in Greek. What he's saying is, I am the Aleph and the Tav. That's what he'd be saying in Hebrew. But it's translated from Greek, which says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And in general, we understand that as, but these guys knew what was going on. And John, when he put, in the beginning was the Word. He was saying, he, he was a, had a direct revelation and reference to Jesus in the original text of Genesis 1-1. In the beginning was Jesus. This guy we're writing about, the Messiah, in the beginning was the Aleph and the Tav. The Alpha and the Omega, he was there. Literally, in the writings, he was there. And so when you hear that Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, you know, I am the Aleph and the Tav, and there's various other scriptures in the Old Testament, in Isaiah, where there's an Aleph and a Tav. And sometimes they have a Vav in the middle of it, and it's not translated. And the Vav means nail. Uh, you get into some of the Hebrew... It can get really interesting. I'm telling you, this, this isn't just a book written by some dudes that were all on the same page. This is, spans thousands of years, penned by the same person, the Holy Spirit, and it's real and alive, and what, and, and what we teach and what we believe isn't fairy tale or fantasy. It's a real deal, and there's a lot to it. Men have, for years, been studying this and teaching this, and we're not close to getting all the way there, but we're getting progressive revelation over the course of time and we're at the end, and I believe we're getting greater revelation about the Word of God. You know, Smith Wigglesworth, I was given strict instructions on when to quit today. You may have to read Romans 8 on your own when you get home, because that's what I was going to talk about. But uh, Smith Smith. Smith Wigglesworth in 1938 had a prophecy with Lester Summerall. And he, he said, wow, I see, basically, I, I, I don't have it written down, but he, he mentioned three waves of the Spirit. One, he said, after World War II, we're going to have a healing revival, which we had in the 50s, the healing revival, where he said healing will be easy. I mean, it will be easy. And you did. You had preachers that didn't know what you guys know but they were peeling cancer off people's faces because there was a, just an anointing for it. There was a, predis, there was a uh, um, dispensational time for this healing revival. And he said, after that, I see denominational walls being broke down and people getting filled with the Holy Spirit. And this was in 1938. Now that happened in the 70s, what we call the charismatic revival, where people were coming out of Baptist and Lutheran and Methodist and Catholic, and they were getting filled with the Spirit and saying, hey, this is free. I don't have to be governed by a, a church body, not, not by, yes, governed by the Word of God, but not restricted in what my belief system is because of, of some leaving some stuff out. I can get the full meal deal. I can read this myself. I, I've got the Holy Spirit living inside of me. There was a revelation of that in the 70s. 
And then he said, after that, I see large auditoriums with people walking in with notebooks, with notebooks and pencils. And he's referring to what we refer to as the word movement, which wasn't a movement, but it is a dispensational time. And back then, most of the congregational people in the 1930s would have been probably illiterate. They needed a preacher to tell them what the Bible said because they couldn't read it. So for him to see large congregations, now we have what we call mega churches of 10,000 people. And even this is a large church compared to the, the little country churches. Nothing wrong with the little country churches. Most of us might miss that atmosphere. But we're just in a time where with internet and, and, and seating and various things, one message can be go to a lot of people, which I used to have a, uh, an issue with, but it got cleared up last week. Because I, I got to thinking, how can, and I love, like Joel Osteen, love him. Robert Morris stayed in the guy's house for two weeks when I was a freshman in high school down in Texas. Met uh, Pat Richard Robinson. I, I met somebody with big earlobes, is all I remember. <laughs> and uh, like Oral Roberts, some of these, I guess, some of these preachers, they just got big earlobes. <laughs> anyway, um, I thought, how can, how can you pastor 10, 20,000 people as a shepherd? How can you truly protect and feed and, and pastor that many people? And basically, I, one, there's two different things than teaching the word and then pastoring. Well, they have sub-pastors. They probably have for every, kind of like Moses had to do, for every so many people, you know, they've got a, an associate pastor, so they've got that covered. But as far as teaching and thinking, well, Jesus, he's fed 5,000 families, which some say that calculates out to however many thousand people you, based on, you know, the women and the children. He had a mega church in a small town. He was, he had, he, he had no problem teaching the word of God to as many people as would listen. Now, as far as discipling those people, well, down the way through the years of the disciples, discipling people, you know, you had to get and, and pastor those people. And, and the reason that I would be concerned about that is because I want to make sure that this body is pastored and feels pastored. And I know you do. I know you do. But I, I believe that we're going to see a growth spurt. That's what some of this change is, is in preparation for, is we're trying to think through some bottlenecks and some, th some, some things that will be an issue. Because you know what? All it takes, in 9-11 when the towers went down, churches were packed. Because people's mortality, their safety, everything they knew was challenged. And they wanted to know what was going on. And they wanted to know and a lot of people are Christians that don't go to church because they don't see any relevance to getting up and going, which is a shame. There is, and I thank you all for getting up and coming to church because, yes, you can watch it on the Internet. Yes, you can read books and watch TV and all day long, but it's important to be connected to a local body of believers that you can personally be accountable to. And, you know, it does say something about confessing sins to one another, and that's a whole message. But don't, let's quit being scared of being real to one another in the church, thinking people are going to judge. we got some problems sometimes. And the reason we continue having the problems is because we don't say nothing to anybody about it. We harbor it in our hearts and then they're locked into our homes instead of coming to somebody and saying, Brother, i got a problem. You know, I, I can't quit it. Can you pray with me? Can you make me accountable? And instead of thinking that guy's going to be like, Phew, and go to the water cooler and talk about what your problem is, which happens, you know, but, that, but that's, there again, its own thing. But it doesn't matter. The Bible says, you know, to confess your sins to one another. Let's, let's try to be real. You know, outside of Sunday morning, we all got a lot going on. And real quickly, I mean, none of that was... What I was going to talk about, and I will real quick, and I, and I will encourage, because part of this is encouraging a lifestyle of being a Christian, right? And what I was going to talk on is something that I feel strongly about. I talk on Thursdays about it. I allude to it a lot. And 
everything you can talk about in the Word is interconnected. Forgiveness is interconnected with love, which is interconnected with the salvation message, which is interconnected with don't sin, which is interconnected with uh, being led by the Spirit of God. I mean, all these topics that you see in the bookstore, they are all interconnected. They all intertwine and overlap and, and help support the entire walk of a Christian. But something that I, I was strongly pursuing personally was being led by the Spirit of God. I'll read, here's the, here's where I was going to, I was going to start, and I was up this morning changing and being a little nervous, because only because I cared, then I finally realized, you know what, I, either I trust God or I don't, I can't trust me, because me is sitting down worried about it, and only because I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste God's time, and I, I, and least on the list, do I want to waste my time, wasting your time, wasting his time. <laughs> but I, that ain't happening, because you have ears to hear, and God can talk to you, he can minister to you during a song that has nothing to do with the song. The fact that you're here, the fact that he's here, I've had, I've spoken enough, and I've been around enough to know that I've had people come to me and say, man, when you said that one thing, I got delivered from this. I'm thinking, that had nothing to do with what I was talking about. But, but praise God, brother. Yeah, that's what I meant. No, um, and I've had it happen to me where God just speaks to me through, he speaks to me. And that's what we want to get to is where we have ears to hear. We're hearing from God on an individual basis. Uh, Romans 8, 14, and I was going to read the whole chapter and I won't, but I'll start with where I was going to start, and that's Romans 8, I believe it's 14. Yeah, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. And that's us, to be led by the Spirit of God. I may rush through some, Angie, I might rush through some scriptures out of, uh, highlight some scriptures out of Romans 8. Um, I apologize, don't, I don't expect you to catch up because I was going to actually kind of line by line, but, but go home and read it. I mean, that's really what should be going on is we should be encouraging you to be a Christian, not, you know, this shouldn't be the only time you hear this stuff. Because I got to read in this one scripture, I was going to start with, for as many as are led by the Spirit are, of God, are, these are the sons of God, and talk about being led by the Spirit, that inner man. It's not voices, it's not, um, you know, an angel up here showing you which way to go. God can talk to you in a lot of ways, and He has a lot of grace, but you start looking for all these spectacular outward uh, leadings, and there is an enemy out there that's in this world, and he would really love to talk to you and flash a light in front of you. You've got to be led by the Spirit of God inside, and that's your conscience. And when you hear preachers or, or, or Christians say, hey, God told me, hey, God told me that I was in prayer the other day and God told me, I remember that used to bother me. I'm like, how's God talking to all these people? I'm a Christian. But I was expecting some sort of audible voice. And he can talk audibly. But there's a sensitivity to the spirit man within you. And some people are, are built up and grown in it. I've known people that maybe aren't exactly mature, super mature Christians, but they trust their instinct. They trust that inner man. They tr they're led by the Spirit of God, and they do things because they're, maybe they not have a bunch of degrees, and they don't think too highly of themselves. They truly trust the Spirit of God because that's all that, I mean, that's what they rely on. And the whole book, this will be your homework assignment, is to read Romans chapter 8. You can read more, but read Romans chapter 8. There's some gems. I mean, it, Romans chapter 8 is fantastic. That's where a lot of our scriptures that we refer to, uh, it, it, you know, early in Romans chapter 8, it, it says, uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Well, there's a nice one, the scripture to stand on. That's one we like to remind each other about. Who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the Spirit. We're supposed to walk according to the Spirit. So there's two ways to walk. And, and later he, he talks about living by the Spirit or living by, by the flesh. 
So there's two ways you can, you can get up out of bed in the morning and there's two paths you can take. But in the long run, there's still time to change the road you're on. Some of you might know the reference. Um, but you can walk in the spirit or you can walk in the flesh. And you know what? If you don't decide to walk in the spirit, the default mode is the flesh. Because it mentions that in chapter 8. Read chapter 8. Um, for to be carnally minded, this, this is eight, chapter 8, verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Minded. You got to be mindful of which way you're going, what you think. Boy, I, I had a lot. I, I didn't think I was going to have enough to say, and I didn't even get to it. Because what you think about is another thing that's very important to me that I've had a, a personal revelation about. We talk about what words of your mouth. That is important. But you know where you're more accountable than that is what you think. We all think that what we think. I mean, that's the most private, intimate part of you that only you know in God. And you can guard your mouth, and you can work on your actions, but you can be a mess in your mind. And eventually, that's going to work itself out into words and actions. So if you can be in control of your thought realm, real important. This day and age, we got so much coming in, so much coming in that it, it can make you feel like it can make you have panic attacks because there's so much negative information going on in here. You got to take control of it by renewing your mind and the word of God and prayer. And I'm telling you, there's peace and there's calmness there. But it doesn't come just by being a Christian. That puts you on the that puts you in position to walk and to learn. But just being a Christian by itself doesn't produce. It, it produces a type of peace in, in the fact of being filled with the Spirit of God. And you are. In, in verse 8, well, verse 16, it says, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and children and heirs. There's, there's some really wealth of information here. Children of God and heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. That's huge. But you start preaching on that, you get people getting too freed and finding out who they are in Christ and they get mad about that but there's we're co-heirs it says it right here joint heirs with Christ which in the and what that means is what he inherits we inherit you need to think about that we might actually get excited I don't do that. That's my dad's deal. I'm going to have to come up with my own. <laughs> he does that too. I'm telling you, if you ever see me put my head through the drywall, we're having a Holy Ghost meeting. Because <laughs> I'm just generally a little more calm. People say, well, at ball games and rock concerts, people get all excited and bit in church. No, I've been to heavy metal concerts, front row, mosh pit, and I'm like this, you know, just getting bumped around. I've been to big ball games, and you know people are getting mad and, and spilling beer on me and all kinds of stuff. And I'm I'm like this. This is I'm kind of that way. It's okay to be who you are. That's why freedom to worship. If you raise your hands, I used to not raise my hands, right? Because I thought I was just too worried about me, self. I thought, well, people are watching me. It's not what I consciously thought, but that was my problem. I was insecure. So I I remember one time thinking, well, it says to raise hands, and people raise hands. So I'm gonna raise my hands. I'm praising and worshiping and, you know, I mean, nothing was really different in here. You know, I just, my, my shoulders got a little sore. <laughs> and I'm not saying you don't raise hands. I'm just saying it's a heart issue. If you're wanting to express a, 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 uh, a openness, a surrender to God, and it comes out of you that this is what you do, more power to you. Thank you for being obedient and not worried about what people think about you. But if you don't do it, more power to you. If, you, if that's the way you worship in here and you get more excited than you've ever been and you do this. You know, I've never been, read chapter 8 because I'm going to close. Just read, read Romans chapter 8. The Holy Spirit will guide you. He'll teach you. He's the teacher. I ain't the teacher. Pastor Larry, yes, he's the teacher as a ministry gift to you. 
But the teacher is the Holy Spirit. And if you want to know what's going on, read your Bible and be led by the Spirit of God. Because we got some powerful people in this room. If we'd all come together and learn some simple revelations of where two together uh, agree. Two. And I was teasing Billy Brim in Washington, D.C. She's like my mom. You really can't tease her. She's too serious. Because I said, well, Billy, if, if that scripture says we're to agree on earth is anything in God's will, then it's done. I said, well, why don't you and Lynn Hammond just end this whole mess? <laughs> well, that's not what it means. It has to be within God's, and I got it preached at. I, 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 I knew what I was saying was not, it's like me and Chip. You know, we was over in Israel and we had fish and it was like a fish. And so we cut its head off and put a coin in its mouth and put it on a plate and gave it to Billy. And she just looked at it. And of course, we're thinking it's funny, but it didn't work. <laughs> yeah, read chapter 8. There's good stuff in there. You've got to be led by the Spirit of God. And you know what? I do appreciate you guys. I'm not going to keep you too late. I know our goal is to let you get to Shoney's before the Baptists. I'm going to read, though. Here's how I'm going to... I'm not closing. Nancy's going to close out the service. I have a couple things before I turn it over to her. Um, we, we had healing, and, you know, healing can happen at home. Healing can happen in various places. Healing can happen in your heart. And there is a place in Romans where it says, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Any distress, any problem you have. And we have them. I have them. I have heartbreaks. I, got, I get in fights with my kids. I, you know, I got stuff we all got stuff and this is the answer it doesn't say they're not going to be stuff and as a matter of fact it might seem like st stuff tries to take over when you're a christian and you're trying to do right about the time you get the revelation of your authority and who you are boom you get a challenge i had a challenging weekend because i knew you know because of this sunday i had to be up here prepared i can tell you on Thursdays when I speak, that's the day that the tire goes flat, the dog dies, and, you know, somebody cusses you, and somebody quits the church. I mean, it just is amazing. But what I've started doing is I've been stepping back prior to those days and taking authority and saying, devil, you have no place in this church in my life, and in the name of Jesus, get I don't wait till before walking through the door, because you have authority either way. People used to say in, in, in Pentecostal charismatic churches, it was always, people were bound so much denominationally that they loved the freedom of being able to do whatever they want and saying, well, we're just going with the Spirit. Well, you know what, this, it, you know, that's fine. I have no problem with that. But you know, the Holy Spirit can tell you the night before how he's gonna do the meeting. You don't have to wait and just through the Spirit have two hours of music and all kinds of stuff go on because, and, and that's fine too, as long as you're led by the Spirit of God. But a lot of times I've been in services that were so free because we're all just being led by the Spirit that there's some flesh that snakes its way in the door and it will scare people. And I've been in some Holy Ghost meetings where the Spirit takes, I mean, the Spirit's always here, always here. But, I, I, you know, we've been in some where the Holy Spirit really takes an authoritative figure above any human that's in the room and has his way in a way that's a little different where people are crawling to the door and you know there's clouds i mean and i love that i tell you what you guys hang around and you're going to see some moves of the spirit because in that smith wigglesworth prophecy i didn't finish with this in the smith wigglesworth prophecy he said after that after the people walking into the big auditoriums with the notebooks i see the greatest revival god that's ever been on the planet and ever will be um he said hospitals being emptied out i mean the end time revival, the final push to get as many people into the kingdom before the return of Christ. And that all up in that Todd, the Alpha and Omega, he's there. And he says in Revelations 1-8, I'm going to come back. And I am the Alpha and the Omega. And it's going to happen. And it's, it's happening. And it's, there's a lot to be thankful for. Okay, I'm going to hand let Nancy close out service because she had called me this week and we organized this and, and uh, it's, it's being led by the Spirit prior to the service. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, I'll read this. 
This is, I like this. This is how Paul, because I'm done after this. She's going to have, uh, introduce altar ministers and some things and pray and close out. But at the end of 2 Corinthians, I like Paul, Paul says, and this is me to you guys, finally, brethren, finally. You're probably thinking, finally. <laughs> finally, brethren, farewell. Become complete. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Take that in cultural context, please. All the saints greet you. The grace, and these aren't just words, this is the word of God. Receive this. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit. The, the, the Trinity is all expressed here. The grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, God is love, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to commune with him. You know, the Holy Spirit is not there to just beat you up. He's a helper. He's a comforter. Every time you hear something about the Holy Spirit uh, and, and, and the person of the Holy Spirit, he is not the hammer. He's the comforter. He's the teacher. He's the helper. You know, if you start thinking, man, Father, I want, thank you for sending a helper in place of Jesus left. He says, when I go, I send another. Let's not uh, let that be in vain. And the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.